On February 27th, SpaceX launched the first set of upgraded Starlink satellites for its second generation constellation, featuring increased capacity and new technologies. Unfortunately, this first set of larger second generation Starlink satellites is experiencing problems that could require SpaceX to deorbit at least some of them. In a March 22nd tweet, SpaceX chief executive Elon Musk said there were some issues with the set of Starlink satellites launched on the 27th of February, confirming industry speculation over the last several days based on the changing orbits of the spacecraft. Lots of new technology in Starlink version 2, so we're experiencing some issues as expected, he wrote. Some satellites will be deorbited, others will be tested thoroughly before raising altitude above space station. The 21 satellites collectively known as Group 6-1 started raising their orbits a couple of days after being deployed into orbits nearly 370 kilometers high. However, the satellites halted their orbit raising a few days later, maintaining orbits at altitudes of about 380 kilometers. Kilometers. The International Space Station is in an orbit between 415 and 420 kilometers high. Starting around March 15th, their orbital altitude started to decrease at varying rates, most gradually, but at least two more steeply descending to about 365 kilometers. All 21 remain in orbit, but that unusual behavior prompted speculation of problems with the satellites. The tweet by Musk was the first comment by him or SpaceX confirming problems with the satellites, although neither he nor the company has elaborated on what those problems are. The 6-1 group of satellites are the first of what SpaceX calls version 2 mini versions of Starlink satellites. They are significant larger than the first-generation Starlink satellites that SpaceX has launched more than 4,000 of to date. The spacecraft features improved phased array antennas and the use of E-band frequencies for backhaul that gives each satellite four times the capacity of earlier spacecraft. They also have new higher-performance electric thrusters that use argon rather than krypton propellant to reduce costs. SpaceX hasn't released specifics about the V-2 mini-satellites, but a design called F-9-2 in filings the company made with the Federal Communications Commission as part of its application for the second-generation constellation describes a spacecraft with a mass of 800 kilograms and a pair of solar arrays 12.8 meters long. As the name suggests, the V-2 mini spacecraft are scaled down versions of the ultimate version 2 Starlink satellites, which will weigh about 2,000 kilograms each with solar arrays 20 meters long. Those spacecraft will launch on SpaceX's Starship vehicle, while the V-2 mini spacecraft are small enough to be launched on Falcon 9 rockets. The FCC partially authorized SpaceX's second generation, or Gen 2, Starlink Constellation back in December, allowing the company to launch 7,500 of its proposed 30,000 satellites into orbit, ranging from 525 to 535 kilometers. SpaceX has since launched four sets of Group 5 satellites into Gen 2 orbits authorized by the FCC, but those appear to be effectively identical to earlier Starlink satellites. Another Group 5 launch is scheduled for as soon as March 24th from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. A second set of version 2 mini satellites, Group 6-2, is scheduled to launch no earlier than March 30th, also from Cape Canaveral, but it is uncertain if these issues with the V-2 mini satellites in orbit will delay that launch. Next up in the news, Relativity Space, the ambitious company, launched the world's first 3D printed rocket but ended with a dead second stage. The 110-foot-tall Terran-1 rocket rose from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station's Launch Complex 16 in Florida for a flight test dubbed Good Luck, Have Fun, or GLHF. The startup's first-ever launch brought frustration as well as fun. Liftoff was originally scheduled for the 8th of March, but the countdown was called off 70 seconds before launch due to a malfunctioning valve in the ground equipment responsible for conditioning the rocket's liquid oxygen propellant. Fixes were made and Relativity tried again on the 11th. The launch was scrubbed twice due to high upper-level winds and a boat in the launch safety range. A third attempt was cancelled half a second before liftoff due to a launch commit criteria violation. The final launch attempt was also unsuccessful due to an issue with automatic stage separation. 
Terran 1 finally made its ascent into the night sky at 11.25 p.m. Eastern or 8.25 p.m. Pacific on March 22nd. Look at that blue fire, said launch commentator Arwa Tizani Kelly, referring to the glow of the rocket's methane-tinged exhaust. Look at that blue fire! Because the primary aim of the flight was to put a completely new launch vehicle through its paces, no customer payload was placed on the rocket. Instead, a metal memento from Relativity's first 3D print job was flown. The flight plan called for telemetry to be sent down from the Terran 1 as it climbed toward its planned 125 mile high or 200 kilometer high orbit, and then for the stages to descend back through the atmosphere. The first stage's main engine cutoff and stage separation appeared to go according to plan, drawing yips of delight from the launch team. But the second stage suffered an anomaly, and the rocket fell short of reaching orbit. Although we didn't reach orbit, we significantly exceeded our key objective for this first launch, and that objective was to gather data at max Q, one of the most demanding phases of flight, and achieve stage separation, Tizani Kelly said. Today's flight data will be invaluable to our team as we look to further improve our rockets. Fellow launch commentator Rachel Anacito said the flight data would be analyzed in the days ahead to determine the cause of the anomaly. All in all, Terran 1's 9 Aeon engines in flight is a beautiful sight to behold. Congratulations to the team. You are step by step reaching space. In fact, Relativity touts Terran 1 as the world's first 3D printed rocket and says its software driven technique can produce less expensive launch vehicles in as little as 60 days. Many rockets use 3D printed components nowadays, but Terran 1 sets a new standard because the rocket is 85% 3D printed by mass. Terran 1's first stage is powered by nine Aeon engines, which use liquid oxygen and liquefied natural gas as propellants. The second stage has one Aeon VAC engine that's optimized optimized for operation in the vacuum of space. Ellis co-founded the company in 2015 after working at Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin space venture for two years. In a series of tweets sent out before the first launch attempt, he reminisced about the early days with fellow co-founder Jordan Noon in Seattle. Seven years ago, I co-founded Relativity Space, which feels like a lifetime ago, but is an incredibly short time frame in the scheme of things in aerospace, Ellis wrote, especially starting as two people in a WeWork truly from scratch where we had to rally and scrap together every ounce of funding, team facility, and technology starting from absolutely nothing. Bezos responded to Ellis's reminiscence with best wishes for the launch. Can't wait to see the whole team succeed, he tweeted. Although Terran 1 isn't designed to be recovered, Relativity Space is already working on a larger, fully reusable rocket called the Terran R. The rocket that would have a maximum payload capacity of more than 44,000 pounds or 20,000 kilograms for missions to low Earth orbit, compared with Terran 1's capacity of only 2,750 pounds or 1,250 kilograms. Terran R's first launch could come as early as 2024. And that's all the information we have for you today. If you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time.